Namaste everyone. Welcome to the Charvak Podcast. This is your host Kushal Mehra. All right, today's podcast is about Bangladesh uh, and specifically about uh, American interference in Bangladesh. Just to give everybody a brief background, on Wednesday, November the 15th, the Chief Election Commissioner uh, of uh, Bangladesh, uh, Kazi Habibul Awal, he made an announcement that on January 7th, 2024 will be the date that the general elections of Bangladesh will be held. And there have been a lot of developments in and around elections in Bangladesh. Uh, the Americans have a certain point of view. Indians have a certain point of view. The Chinese have an interesting point of view. And so do the Russians. So there are four players. And I told Abhijit, Aja bhai, baate karte hai isme. So Abhijit, welcome. Bahua, Boitra. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh... So, where should we start? Uh, let, let's start for not with the history. First, let's start with the current state of affairs. Abhijit, matlab, mm. I was trying to read up. Many there links be bhejete, some papers mm. and many other things. I was trying to read up on the history of America and Bangladesh. Now, uh, what has been the American history? From what I have understood, the Americans have never been so direct. in their uh, interference in bangladesh in the sense of yes. elect elections now uh, ca- can you maybe start there first okay i'll tell you what why don't you list out the four different points of view and it'll be much easier then for me to start contextualizing everything okay so the first main point of view is that what is the american point of view let's first explain what are the americans talking about right now because the american ambassador over there what is his name peter haas right if i got his name right i don't know the pronunciations of american names mm-hmm. uh, right but the he has already met uh, leaders of all sorts of political parties he has given direct statements about americans being concerned about court free and fair elections to be held in bangladesh and mm-hmm. under pressure from the americans from what i have understood is bangladesh for the first time in its history has agreed to foreign observers coming and observing how elections are conducted in bangladesh so can we first break that down no no mention the four points because i'm not familiar with the russian uh, thing i know what the chinese and indian thing is so go through all four and then i'll start breaking it down for you okay yeah so the second point is obviously uh, this is like uh, some weird game of thrones level shit happening in bangladesh right now because you have the indians and the chinese in san in absolute insane levels i never thought this would happen but the indians and the chinese are backing the same horse in yeah. this game which is abhijit i want you to explain this to me because i don't understand foreign policy you have to explain this how the hell have the indian and chinese gotten on the same side which is the awami league like both are mm. backing this to the hilt the russians on the other hand are kind of backing the awami league playing footsie with the other side and completely going and backing from a defense perspective with bangladesh right now and the russians are obviously pulling their weight in that sense now i shared that paper with you abhijit if you remember uh, that is an analysis uh, from a bangladeshi author and uh, that paper analyzes the entire relation right from cold war to the new cold war where bangladeshi foreign policy vis-a-vis united states and russia that's by sheikh sams morsalin which was read uh, you know he's from the university of dhaka now that paper analyzes the entire history of how the russians and the americans have played with each other where initially obviously the americans were interested in a kind of thing and the and uh, historically as far as trade is concerned bangladesh has always had a very great trade relation with america uh, thanks mm. to by and large the awami league policy of you know kind of non alignment like uh, ours uh, if i was kind, to say kind kind of yeah kind, kind of. of right from okay, what so, i have understood like, correct me so, if i'm wrong so now let me break this down for you theek hai uh, the first thing is we need to understand that america works in uh, different silos right now there is no uniform policy and because of that because you have a president and a vice president who are completely ineffective you have several different silos articulating several different policies towards bangladesh okay uh, there is a extremely the democrats are very ideological about it and they tend to be very uh, some parts of that ideological fringe of the democrats are in power and they tend to be extremely vocal about human rights and crap like that it doesn't matter that the human rights that they're advocating in this particular case 
is diametrically opposite to what they were advocating in, say, 2006 in the West, in Palestine. There they were saying that the election of Hamas is a travesty. You can't have this as a Hitler election. Democracy sometimes produces. Remember, Hitler was democratically elected. And uh, the Hamas election was a Hitler election. Now, here you have the jamaat e islami which is the main opposition. Okay, because uh, Khalid Azia is no longer realistically in the picture. Okay, so now what happens is the jamaat e islami is the main thing. What is their main platform? Uh, see, the jamaat e islami is gaining a lot of, and uh, uh, Hasina is doubling down on this. Because they started, the jamaat e islamis popularity started when they rallied against the Supreme Court. Outside the Supreme Court was a statue of justice, which is this lady holding the scales and she is blind, blindfolded. Okay. They rallied against that saying, this is idolatry, remove it. Hasina caved. Every one of us knew at that point that their next thing was going to be Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Why? Because there is a cult of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman out there. His photos are there everywhere. Everything is Mujib this or Mujib that. And the Statue of Justice was the first step to attacking this sort of cult of indoctrination that was uh, being created, in a sense. Okay. This was number one. Number two, Khalid Zia went on losing elections by herself. The problem was Sheikh Hasina maybe overdid it in that she also politically castrated them because, well, Khalid Azia and Sheikh Hasina are both extremely corrupt. But Khalid Azia it was very openly corrupt. And because uh, uh, Sheikh Hasina, for the first time, after several, I think after four or five cycles of Hasina Khalid Azia, Hasina Khalid Azia, Hasina Khalid Azia, finally won the second election, uh, a back to back election. She decided to now start neutralizing. So, like Modi does Congress Muk Bharat, she decided to do uh, 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 Khalida Zia Mukt uh, Bangladesh, based, kind of. Except it was a lot more dictatorial. Here it's electoral castration, there it was actual, uh, you know, uh, throwing people in jail, decimating the party rank and file. And to be fair, there were a lot of people in that particular section, and this is where we should have probably done the history first properly, uh, who were aligned with Pakistan, the Pakistan army, and mm -hmm. the remnants of those who supported the Pakistan army within Khalid Azia's party. Okay, this was a problem. Now, the Americans, they have found some kind of a modus vivendi with the Bangladeshis and they settled on election observers, which means nothing. Because the only thing election observers do is they ensure that the voting process is accurate. But if the parties themselves have been fixed, there's nothing that voting observation can do. They're not election observers, they're voting observers. Okay. Yeah. So this is one thing. Now, the Chinese and Indians backing, this is an old story. This isn't the only time we're backing the same horse. In Burma, we back the same horse, which is that Burma is a sovereign state. Burma should be allowed to do its own thing uh, uh, without foreign interference. You remember, we put up a very strong, uh, uh, this thing against uh, when uh, Cyclone Nargis hit Burma and the Americans and French and British were threatening to regime change them if they didn't allow Western aid in. India put its foot down and we decide to start supplying the Burmese with a huge amount of helicopters and aid and whatnot, precisely to preempt uh, 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 Western interference and things like that. The Russians are doing what the Russians always do, which is they no longer have any ground intelligence in Bangladesh anymore. And because they don't have ground intel, therefore they can't pick a winning horse. And therefore they generally support the government, but they will play footsie with the other side as well. This has generally been the thing. None of these policies, not India's policy, not the Russian policy, and not American policy, is dictated by economics. But to be fair to Sheikh Hasina, her economics have been very, very, very good for Bangladesh. They have been extremely good for Bangladesh because uh, she has actually generated jobs. She's actually generated growth. Has it come at a price? Has it come at great corruption? Yes. But remember, High growth rates in countries like that, there are lots of academic studies to show you result in high corruption till a certain per capita income is reached, at which point economic and uh, uh, sorry, 
uh, law and order and environmental concerns take over, pollution is reduced, corruption is reduced systemically, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are natural growth banks. So this is what has been happening. But to understand this, we need to go back to Bangladesh's history and its history as East Pakistan as well. Yes. yes. So just to back you on the economy bit, uh, just to share some figures with the people. So just from the Indian trade perspective, India's trade from with Bangladesh now has increased from 3.5 billion USD, that was 2009, to almost 16 billion USD in 2022. And a large chunk of it has got to do with the policies of Sheikh Hasina's government, which is the Awami League. Now, as far as Khalida Zia is concerned, from what I understand is she's been in house arrest for a while, right? She's she's just there and one one child is in London and I think other was attacked in Kuala Lumpur or something or some sort or something of mm. that sort had happened, if I, if I know this correctly. But I have a follow-up question here. What are the reasons of the Chinese to back the, the Awami League? Um, so this is something that we do in order the Chinese know who's going to win and who's not, who's got the ground uh, uh, mobilization and who's not. Uh, they realize that if Islamists come to power in Bangladesh, this will be some kind of support factor for Islamic separatism within China itself. Okay, uh, It will also destabilize the Rohingyas in Burma. Burma is a crucial ally to China. Because remember, Rohingyas are not ethnically Burmese. They're ethnically Bengalis, kind of. Okay? So there is this thing where China does not want any Islam Islamic politics cropping up anywhere in its neighborhood or backyard as far as it can avoid it. Okay? Here, it is a bit too close. They expect a lot of fallout to happen out there, number one. Number two, Sheikh Hasina has been very good to the Chinese. OK, uh, she gives them economic growth. She allows them to invest. She allows them to develop, which is very good for them. And unlike, say, Pakistan, which does not provide returns on investment, Bangladesh actually provides returns on investment, which is a very, very good thing. There is also this thing that Bangladesh has very significant offshore uh, gas and things which the Chinese also want to develop. And they don't want to alienate uh, Sheikh Hasina and end up losing contracts and things like that, especially because they're up against uh, the Japanese on this. The Japanese also want that contract. The Japanese will probably get that contract. But anyway, the Chinese want to try their luck. Now, Bangladesh is also a big buyer of Chinese defense equipment. Yeah, I want you okay. to talk about this. Yeah. Uh, now, Chinese equipment is mostly shit. Uh, so they're very happy when any country buys their shit. And Bangladesh finds it very easy to buy their shit. Now, there's no accountability in Bangladesh. There is actually, I hate Al Jazeera, but I'm still going to recommend an Al Jazeera documentary. I'm going to put, actually, let me search for it right now. It is on <laughs> how blatant uh, the corruption within the Bangladesh army is. Okay. Mentary uh, Bangladesh. All the Prime Minister's men copy link okay let me just uh yeah it's al jazeera investigations let me share that link with you here in the private dm and you mm -hmm. can maybe put it up and play the first few seconds or whatever for them no oh, they will it copy is... copyright strike it but i'll share okay, the link with everyone share share the link put the link up in the uh, uh description box as well so people can click on it the kind of corruption is insane. The army chief's brother gets all the uh, military contracts and things. And he's wanted for murder. How nice. Yeah. So this is the kind of stuff that's happening out there. So look, it, it's, a, it's a deal that suits China. And China knows that as long as economic growth continues, which can it can only continue under the Awami League, China has a good deal out here. And the Bangladeshis know exactly how to balance between China and India, and they're very good at it. They are politically more pro-India. They're economically more pro-China, which kind of China's fine. They're, they're quite pragmatic about it. We're also pretty damn pragmatic about it. We have no issues with that. We're not like, say, the Maldives or something like that, that's stuck in all kinds of uh, uh, issues. We would have, the relationships would have been politicized. 
had mm-hmm. uh, this whole thing between Khalid Azia and Sheikh Hasina been happening. But right now, because it's kind of one party rule, that has not been happening. Okay, mm. so she can balance those policies very, very well. So just to back you up, uh, China indeed has emerged as the top defense supplier to Dhaka and has increased investments by 38 billion US dollars since mm. 2016. Uh, I am reading of uh, ORF piece, analyzing this entire thing. Now, now I want to take you to America. Now, is the American ungli, whatever the Americans are doing, is this primarily driven because um, for America, China is the real competition, right? It's mm. it's not about anything else. Uh, as much as Indian uh, nationalists and patriots want to think that America is offended by India, America is not really offended or perturbed by India. It is perturbed no. by China. So do yeah. you think the increasing influence of China in Bangladesh, especially in defense equipment, and America is always interested in selling arms and ammunition to everybody in the world. Do you think that's why America is playing this game? No, because look, American, they know Bangladesh will never be able to afford American equipment. You know, Bangladesh once bought high-end Russian equipment, the MiG-29s. They weren't able to maintain it. Uh, it proved to be frightfully expensive for them and they had to kind of downgrade to Russian trainers and things like that. Uh, They don't have the ability to maintain a lot of this stuff. So, you know, American equipment would be completely, and the Americans know this very well. Uh, You know, it's at a technology level which Bangladesh would find impossible to maintain. It won't suit the Bangladeshis and they completely respect the fact that, you know, Chinese uh, equipment is at a certain level which suits Bangladesh almost perfectly. So that isn't what is driving it. What is driving policy is this kind of doctrinaire ideological policy. Because we keep telling the Americans, because remember, they always talk to us about Bangladesh as well. They talk to us about Burma. And we have consistently told them for the last 20, 30 years, boss, stop getting your antlers up for everything. Stop reacting to every little pinprick. It never helps out here to do that. Because what happens is, with Burma, the Burmese understand how to microbalance very, very well. The Bangladeshis, at least under Sheikh Hasina, know how to do this very well. You keep your overly long noses out and stop interfering because the moment you interfere, things turn against you and it will go into China's lap. We want to prevent these people from going. See, America has this very, your with us or against us kind of a black and white binary towards relationships. India doesn't. We completely understand how these small countries need to play their games and we let them play their games. We respect we respect them when they play their games. There are some lines that should not be crossed that Nepal once crossed and Maldives, I think, is now crossing, which uh, 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 India will not react to very well. But overall, uh, as long as those countries know what the lines are, we give them a huge amount of freedom to do what they want to do. Uh, I mean, it's not our place to be giving them freedom. Uh, Let's be clear about it. But in terms of how we behave with them, it is always a kind of a warm, cordial relationship with them. The Sri Lanka, we've always had, like with Hamban Tota, we've always kind of understood where they're coming from. And with Hamban Tota, they they told us, you know, the Sri Lankans told us, you come and put your surveillance submarines, park them outside. We won't mind the approach routes to Hamban Tota. You keep spying on all the Chinese electronic emissions that come out of ships coming into Himban Tota. And we also used to say, yeah, sure, man, let's do it. Uh, It did get telegraphed up to the top levels of government, but the Navy was very happy with that. So, you know, the Sri Lankans always also knew how to play the game. The Bangladeshis know how to play the game. The Burmese know how the Burmese are masters. Nobody can compete with the Burmese because the Burmese do something which the Sri Lankans and uh, Bangladeshis aren't. They cancel contracts midway and throw the Chinese out every five, six years. Right. Hayla. So, huh? Yeah. Kar dete? yeah, they do that. <laughs> so, Burmese boss, nobody, not North Korea, not Japan, not South Korea, nobody can deal with the Chinese the way the Burmese do. The Burmese have managed the Chinese like nobody else has. Okay. Uh, and unlike the Vietnamese, they've not had to go to war. Sure, the Vietnamese thrashed the Chinese, but these guys have not had to fight, lose a single drop of blood in their dealings with the Chinese. Okay, so it's 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 very uh, uh, the Americans have this thing that we know better. 
you know what you don't know better i think local countries should be allowed to decide their own policies and you telegraph what your bilateral red lines are you can't go decide what bangladesh does in, in inside its country and what uh, uh, burma does inside its country and what sri lanka does inside its country hmm now some of the things abhiji the americans have said so the joe biden administration as per this frontline.thehindu.com uh, piece says the joe biden administration in the us has announced a series of punitive measures to check bangladesh's court democratic backsliding and ensure the parliamentary election is free and fair in addition to the threat of imposing visa sanctions against anyone who engages in election rigging the us state department has imposed sanctions on a number of serving and retired officials of the rapid action battalion rab a paramilitary force that has been accused of helping sheikh hasina's party the awami league win past elections Uh, basically sheikh hasina has been accused of manipulating elections and intimidating political opin- opponents to pave way for her unchallenged authority so like this is the americans upping the ante right like stating we will not give you visas we will put sanctions and we will do x and we will do they've not done stuff like this in the past right they have not and that is the uh, complete uh, this thing which is i guess why bangladesh decide to allow election observers in which is kind of a climb down on uh, uh, america's kind of a climb down on americans america's part what worries me here is that india didn't put its foot down with the americans okay mm. uh, there is some kind because you know when it came to both sri lanka and bangladesh india used to kind of act as as an intercessory power in washington uh that's not happened clearly and for them to be making public statements like this is a bit over the top so it is very problematic i don't know again because see these days it's impossible to tell you which silo in the government is uh um uh, you know uh, controlling policy who is going to get there and you know sometimes the president doesn't even listen like you saw how you know at that press conference after meeting uh, uh, xi jinping he came out and called xi jinping a dictator and you saw the look on anthony blinken's face who was like <laughs> very he kind of this thing <laughs> so you know it's across the board because all secretaries derive their power from a powerful president if there isn't a powerful president lots of verticals within the government decide to do what they want to do and things like that so yeah this is like do, look it's it's all abhijit i find it very hard to believe that the americans care about anything after being kind to pakistan because what is the free and fair election and democracy in pakistan which is one of their quote and quote allies what, like what are the americans smoking look uh, they've abandoned pakistan long back they're not helping pakistan so if you can't you use pakistan against them but look at a lot of their other allies who are complete dictatorships boss you are in qatar uh, you have a treaty obligation to qatar saudi and emirates ki to baat hi chhod but in qatar you there is not one middle eastern ally of yours who is an actual functioning democracy to kiski baat kar rahe ho kabhi himmat hai tumhara to put uh, sanctions on the uh, uh, on the saudi police they'll do it for jamal khashoggi but they won't do it for the average saudi right mm. so these things are par equations okay they bully who they can they don't bully who they can't so what do you make of this statement by michael kugelman abhijit he for people who don't know michael kugelman is the director of the washington based asia institute he says that bangladesh was not strategically so significant that the us could not risk rocking the boat bangladesh is a key partner but not a key strategic bet in the us scheme and this gives the administration the leeway to press ahead on rights and democracy issues yeah yeah so basically what he's saying is, is correct this is this is where uh, you know your value to america isn't more important than the ideology of the government right now mm 
so basically we can we can uh, so the american way is if i need you desperately i'll stop chiding you if i don't need yeah. you that desperately then i'll constantly do ungal and keep telling you dekh i am daddy listen to daddy behave daddy is mad at you that kind of a thing yes basically but this is, isn't this disgusting then abhijit yeah yeah but see this is how it plays out see it think of it this way it's a carrot and stick policy it's actually quite smart make yourself useful enough to us in one way or another so we don't interfere in your country <laughs> that's so disgusting that that no but it's so... very smart it's very smart you know uh, we will use things against you uh if you don't supply us with this much or become this much of a market for us or this or this or this it's it's a very useful strategy why is it bad why is it wrong yeah it's pragmatic no, that... it's it's transactional but it's pragmatic i don't think it's disgusting i think it's quite um, cold blooded uh my problem is i don't think america is thinking through the downstream consequences of unnecessarily antagonizing it is great for you transactionally for now but if bangladesh goes out of your fold assume they decide to give the chinese a port somewhere at the mouth of the bay of bengal exactly exactly so this is where this is where what used to be smart american policy is unfortunately getting too ideological and too transactional the 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 american sections of the american government are using the transactionalism aspect of that american policy to push their own woke ideology and their agenda without considering downstream consequences because they don't have a secretary of state who's willing to either rein them in or a president who's willing to back that secretary of state up in cracking the whip what do you do mm. now compare this to 2018 abhijit during the last time under the trump administration the trump administration listened to india and they quietly backed sheikh hasina so yes. once again just from a geopolitical perspective don't you think trump had in a very absurd sort of a way a better understanding of foreign policy than biden yeah, well yeah uh, trump was generally better at everything i think we can say with the benefit of hindsight no uh, but yeah. i was saying that i i was saying that throughout uh unlike some people who said oh biden is now in charge the world can breathe mm. uh, you can't breathe i mean <laughs> look i think first the democrats are not good at foreign policy they, they genuinely there is nothing more dangerous than a do gooder these people are do gooders and there is nothing more dangerous than a do gooder because a do gooder is fundamentally a fanatic who believes mm-hmm. i have no issues with opportunists who don't believe i have huge issues with ideologues who believe in certain things okay mm-hmm. number 1 number 2 trump did not believe so you could sell him if you made a good enough case he would accept it here there are certain things for these people that are not negotiable and they don't realize the kind of long term damage it does to them there's nothing you can do about it there's a reason that trump was able to bring about the abraham accords and the democrats couldn't do it for the last and and even republican administrations that relied on the same pool of people that democrats did could do nothing about the middle east for the last 40 50 years hmm. Hmm. now i want to read some other comments abhijit from another piece that i had shared with you from the diplomat okay so here i'm going to read it again many in india wrongly take this to mean that the united states favors the bnp which is khalid azia's party for those who don't know over the awami league which is sheikh hasina's party this is not true this was said by daniel marke a senior advisor for south asia at the united states institute of peace usip 
uh, he pointed out that Washington court would simply like to see Bangladesh achieve its potential as a democratic partner and fast growing economy in the region. Another quote, uh, India's suspicions about American aims in Bangladesh have restricted closer India-US cooperation in Bangladesh, although overall ties between Washington and New Delhi are warmer than ever before. I don't know what's happened to Daniel. He used to be very sane and suddenly, you remember the piece he did last year no? on India mm -hmm. saying that uh, we need to sanction India and this and that and whatnot. India is becoming a dictatorial uh, shithole and whatnot. I don't know what's happened to Daniel. You know, they're all required to kind of genuflect in front of their respective liaisons at state and things like that. So look i'm I'm not taking i'd never take the diplomat seriously and i'm not going to take daniel because daniel is not a big player on the india even michael kugelman isn't a big player on the south asia scene in the american state department's view of okay india. now now let us come to the indian side right so we've we've seen china we've seen america now let us come to our neck of the woods now we have never hidden this. We have obviously put all our eggs in the Sheikh Hasina basket. But to explain the Indian story, Abhijit, here's where we have to do the history of Bangladesh. Yeah. Okay. Wait kar tha ki now tell the entire history because you don't understand until and unless the Indian relationship till you go back to the history. Now take right. your time, explain the history. Now. Uh, I'm going to start with the independence of Bangladesh because all Indians know key what happened in the Bangladesh war, but they don't know what happened after the Bangladesh war. Okay. Now, Bangladesh becomes independent and Sheikh Mujibur Rahman is no Democrat. Okay. He declares Bangladesh a one-party state and it becomes a very corrupt and dictatorial one-party state where everybody... So there were a lot of people, Biharis and things like that, who had immigrated. They couldn't move to West Pakistan, so they moved to East Pakistan. And they uh, they were seen as collaborators. They had collaborated with the Pakistan army in killing out and taking out all those massacres and things like that. So what happened was there was a general crushing of all the Islamist elements who had supported the Pakistan army, who believed that Islam was greater than Bengaliness. Uh, there was also a crushing of these Biharis and things who had supported them because they didn't feel Bengali and uh, therefore they had supported Islam over Bengal. There was also a crushing of all the political opposition and dissent even within the Awami League against Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Now, Mujibur Rahman would have generally gotten away with all of this had it not been for the famine of 1974. People don't remember the famine of 1974, uh, 73 or 74, I forget now. But there was a huge famine immediately after independence, which killed off about 1.5 million Bangladeshis. And remember, at that time, Bangladesh population was just 60 million. So uh, let me just check this uh, Bangladesh famine 1974. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, let me share the screen. I'm just putting up because this is the easiest, of course, is the uh, the great books about it. But um, I want people to see. Yeah, can you see? Yeah, I'm putting it up. Yeah, the government claims only 27,000. It was, in fact, 1.5 million. Holy right, Lord. it was insane. It was absolutely insane. What a tragedy. Yeah. My goodness. Uh, yeah. And Oof. it was, yeah, and, and, and people don't realize it, it, it was one of the worst famines of the 20th century. In terms of numbers, it was insane. And the problem was most of the people had died even before the government realized that they had died. Right, because information systems were uh, 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 simply not peaked. The, all the information systems had died in the wake of, you know, they were building a new state because the Pakistanis had raised everything to rubble. Uh, a lot of the capacity had gone out of Bangladesh. Hmm. This is what laid the root for Mujib's downfall. Because you can't survive a famine like that. And so there was a bunch of officers out there led by uh, Zia, not Zia ul -Haq, 
another Zia, who is Khalid. Rahman, right? Rahman, right? Rahman. You just call him Zia. By yeah. Zia, who uh, believed that, you know, there was a halfway point between Islam and Bengaliness and this kind of militant, uh, uh, this thing that uh, cleansing of society that uh, uh, Mujibur Rahman was doing. Not that Mujibur Rahman was very secular or anything, but this is all we're talking, it's all relative as the joke goes. Uh, so Zia was behind the coup. Hmm. Zia almost certainly uh, aided and abetted it because he never punished the people who killed off Sheikh Mujibur Rahman's entire family. The entire family was wiped out except Sheikh Hasina because she was she wasn't. Sheikh Hasina and her sister, both of whom were in Germany at that time, I think. Uh, and they were not killed. Other than that, even the three-year-old baby was shot to death and killed. The eldest son's son, so Sheikh Mujibur Rahman's three-year-old grandson was killed uh, by a bullet wound. Okay, it was done with a passion. It was done very specifically to wipe out the entire family. It was meant to be a decapitation strike. After which Zia takes over. He tries stabilizing the country. The stabilization doesn't really work. Surprise, surprise. He also gets killed off. And Khalida Zia fundamentally believes that India is the one that had her husband killed off. I personally uh, disagree with that. But then, you know, the when these uh, theories take their own... Uh, in countries like this, if you say India killed him off, it will be believed. The problem is... Khalida Zia, who should know better, actually believes, she genuinely believes that we had her husband killed off. And then came uh, Ershad, uh, who started bringing in all the NGOs. At one point, in Bangladesh was an NGO heaven. There wasn't a single NGO that didn't find work to go there and implement their policies and things like that. But it wasn't the NGO stuff that actually turned Bangladesh around. It was the industrialization that the Awami League started when Ershad was removed from power and Sheikh Hasina came to power. That things actually started to move. But every time it was like, you know, five steps forward, three steps back when Khalida Ziyad came. The problem is Sheikh Hasina has always been very pragmatic. She's even been willing to kind of forgive Khalida Zia for well, Khalida Zia's husband for killing her family. But Khalida Zia can never forgive India for killing her husband. Allegedly. Okay. She makes everything very dogmatic and doctrinaire. And because the Awami League is considered secular, therefore all the Islamists and the rump elements uh, in uh, uh, Bangladesh, which is the Bayaris and the people who had supported the army, they all used uh, uh, Khalida Zia's party, the BNP, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, hide themselves and further their political career and things like that. Ultimately, it came to the point after two fro, two fro, two fro, when Sheikh Hasina, when people started realizing that Sheikh Hasina was actually good for the economy, she won a second successive election. She then decided things are now stable enough for me to go after Khalida Zia, and she's wiped Khalida Zia out purely on corruption charges. Because let's face it, everything that Khalida Zia and her son have been found guilty of, they are in fact guilty of. There is copious amounts of evidence to show that they are guilty of all of this. Now. Sheikh Hasina feels very indebted to India, so she will never cross India's because, you know, we were the only country that gave her uh, refuge and things like that and looked after her when she was in exile and things like that. Uh, she, she's always been quite, she, she's not going to compromise Bangladesh's national interest, but she's always going to look out for India as well. She sees no reason to antagonize anyone. She is not the type who has antagonized anyone ever. Khalid Azia, on the other hand, antagonizes everybody all the time. Except maybe China, here and there. And maybe not Pakistan. Once in a blue moon. So Khalid Azia kind of brought this upon herself. Sheikh Hasina has kind of created this by herself. And this is where the history of India, Bangladesh is. Now, India, did, India should have kind of ensured that she did not. Now, and see, this is a gray area. We should have convinced her. To not destroy the opposition to the point where the only opposition is an extremist Islamist opposition. 
But how do we do that? You know, it can be suggested, but we can't interfere in Bangladeshi relations. And I know it's been raised with Sheikh Hasina in private saying, Didi, do you know what you're doing? Because, you know, have you considered what the opportunity cost is? If you remove these people from the calculus, where is the opposition going to congregate? There has to be opposition. Opposition will congregate. Who are they going to congregate under? It is going to be even more extreme Islamist. Khalid Azia, mm -hmm. you can say, I, you know, this you know, this term Islamist, it really doesn't suit what's happening in Bangladesh, but I'm just using it because it's, there are Islamist elements and there are more radical Islamist elements. There are Islamist elements in the Awami League as well. Okay, but I mean, this is all relative, you should remember. Now, what has happened since then is the army is also possibly playing a role because you remember there was the uh, Bangladesh Rifles Rebellion after which the Bangladesh Rifles got disbanded. And the army stayed very loyal to Sheikh Hasina during that time. The Bangladesh Rifles were a paramilitary force that rebelled against the government and they were uh, their leaders were arrested. I think some were hanged and uh, uh, the entire paramilitary force it, in, in, in the Indian context, it's like, say, the BSF or the CRPF rebelling against the government. Mm. Okay, uh, It was very traumatic. Uh, and uh, what ultimately happened was the army is not allowing Sheikh Hasina to act as much against the jamaat -e islami as she would like to. And the deal is, you know, we won't interfere in politics as long as you buy us arms uh, and keep letting us do what we want to do, which she does. But, but what you also see happening out there is the fact that Sheikh, uh, 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 the army is possibly trying to help those Islamists. Now, we saw this with the Gulshan massacre. You know, the Gulshan massacre was this uh, terrorist takeover of a Italian cafe. Uh, some six, seven, let me just check. Uh, the Gulshan massacre. Uh, 2016, yeah. It was called the Holy Artisan Bakery. Gulshan is there uh, in, in Bombay terms, Gulshan would be like Malabar Hills. In Delhi terms, Gulshan would be like Amrita Shergil Marg. Uh, in Madras, uh, Gulshan would be uh, a boat club. So, uh, very posh area. It, the poshest area. Mm -hmm. Okay, the poshest area. Uh, it's where all the rich people live. Uh, so, she, uh, these guys took over. Now, they were conserving bullets. That siege where about 50, 60 people, I don't know, maybe 100 people got killed. They were trying to conserve bullets. They only had one or two guns. The rest were using machetes. They didn't even want to fire bullets because they were trying to. Uh, uh, they were not very well equipped. And yet six, seven years, uh, six, seven months after that, you suddenly see a huge ramp up in the number of weapons uh, a lot of these militants have, the way they're being used. And then, of course, the entire Rohingya problem erupts, and that is a huge inflow of weapons coming in. Now, we really don't know. There is a lot of question marks around the Rohingya issue and Bangladesh's involvement in it, because a lot of the things we see coming out of Rohingya-related Twitter handles is that they understand proportionality and what civilian attack on civilian populations are. And they were actually preempting the Myanmar's army, predicting what the Myanmar's army would do, which means it was almost certainly gamed a certain way. Okay. And uh, they were very careful in doing that. They, um, uh, anyway, they were also extremely well equipped. They went and uh, killed a lot of policemen, which is why the Burmese army went berserk and then attacked them. And then, you know, uh, when the Burmese army goes berserk, uh, you know, a third world military can't collect intelligence. A third world military can't do precision strike. So then it's just burn everything, destroy everything kind of rampage that goes on. Uh, it was provoked. It was very carefully, calibratedly provoked. We still don't know what role the Bangladesh army played out there, but there was a certain influx of arms that happened into, they would like to blame it, but we've actually seen the sophistication of these terror elements within Bangladesh go up even before the Rohingya problem became a Rohingya problem. We think, we think 
that these people running those Twitter handles are trained in the West, that is the Indian intelligence assessment, and that there is a common chain of supply to these militants in Bangladesh and to the Rohingyas. Because they understand Western ju human rights jurisprudence and proportionality jurisprudence. They talk and tweet in a way that is very specifically aimed at Western countries to trigger off very specific previous instances of NATO intervention in Yugoslavia and Serbia in ways and methods that were used to kill policemen. You know, the, the, uh, uh, the Kosovo war was triggered by Kosovo terrorists killing policemen, which then made the Serbian army go on the rampage. And what happened in uh, 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 with the Rohingyas, what started off the so-called Rohingya genocide in uh, uh, Burma also started off exactly the same. The same kind of weapons, possibly the same groups. We know for a fact there is an overlap between those Rohingya groups and the groups operating in Bangladesh. Hmm. Now, as far as I have understood is, uh, there is another uh, bit of commentary that has been made about Bangladesh. And this is especially relevant from the Indian perspective is that Sheikh Hasina's uh, decision to basically crush the BNP, Khalid Azia's party, has basically led to the rise of Islamism or Islamist opposition parties. And... And in 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 this entire uh, process of um, Islamist outfits like Hifazat -e Islam Bangladesh, Bangladesh Jamaat -e Islami, and uh, I, I forgot uh, uh, there was another Islami Oikyo Jote. Uh, these three primarily have literally occupied the opposition space of Bangladesh. Now, from an Indian perspective, how does this help India, right? So the whole reason India backs uh, Sheikh Hasina is that she controls the Islamists in Bangladesh much better than compared to BNP. But if she has kind of crushed BNP and the Islamists are now the primary uh, opposition party, then has the Indian strategy borne fruits is my question. It has borne fruits in that you now no longer have the Islamists. The Jamaat-e Islami was kind of always aligned with Khalida. Mm -hmm. The crushing of Khalida means the Islamists are now Islamists. They are no longer uh, uh, under the rubric of a Bangladesh. There is no Bangladesh in Jamaat-e Islami. Okay, Awami League is a Beng Awami is a Bengali word. It isn't an. Uh, uh, the, I mean, it's seen as a. It's not really, but. Uh, it is for all practical purposes, but there's no Bangladesh in Jabhat Islam, which mm. is a pan Islamist ideology anyway. Uh, most countries have a Jamaat Islam, most Muslim countries have a Jamaat Islam. So, so, so what has... ends up happening is it has separated, it has very clearly defined the opposition as an Islamist opposition. There is mm. no more shades of grey to this anymore. The question is, is that really a good thing in a third world country where the uh, 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 the panacea to all ills has been religion, especially Islam? And so it's uh, not a very smart strategy, is it? Yeah. No, so my follow up uh, question, I, Abhijit. So a lot of Indians have been extremely, I know for a fact, the Indian government has been extremely uncomfortable with that. You would have much rather had a Khalid Azia kind of opposition who would act as a uh, diversion for say five years and then keep bringing back Sheikh Hasina for 10 rather than have a ascendant Bangladesh with a very dangerous opposition uh, which will be virulently without checks and balances anti-India and be doing a lot of crap against us when they come to power. So this was exactly that was going to be my follow up analysis that if you en embolden these kinds of forces in your society, it eventually doesn't like from 2009 onwards, the army interference in Bangladesh has been very minimal or whatever is the bare minimal level by their standards. I'm not saying I'm not comparing it by the Indian standard. So before somebody misunderstands me, I'm talking about the Bangladeshi standard now. When you embolden such radical Islamist elements, doesn't it also give an excuse to the army to say that you guys have messed up, there's radical Islamist elements, we step in. Exactly right. Which is why the army is also propping up those radical Islamist elements. Mm. Because, you know, when you have no opposition, what is the balance there? It's only the army. No? Mm. So the army then becomes the arbiter. 
So yeah. the Jamati Islami will only go berserk when the army gives it the green light to go berserk. And Sheikh Hasina's political genius is in seeing to it that that point is never reached. The so, question uh, is how far how far will she go to prevent the army from green lighting the Jamaat Islam? So I also wanted to understand like uh, isn't hasn't Awami League successfully kind of banned the Jamaat Islami and kind of managed to create some uh, semblance of uh, convincing the cent so called centrists to participate in the elections to give it some semblance of legitimacy or something of that sort? Not really. I mean, I don't think anybody's going to buy that. It's it's pretty much a preordained election result. Uh, not because it's rigged or anything, but because most of the other parties are pretty much destroyed. It's not banned from contesting. You know, the uh, uh, BNP can contest. The point is their finances have been completely destroyed. They have no uh, leaders. They have no finances. Uh, what you know, it requires money to run a party. It requires money to run, uh, money to run an election campaign. When you don't have any of that, how are you want to run a campaign? Now, one last question from the Indian perspective before we start taking viewers' questions. Look, these are dynasty parties, right? In the case of Awami League, uh, Mujibur Rahman's daughter is Sheikh Hasina. In the case of the BNP, which is the main party, it is Khaled Azia, who is the wife of Zia Rahman, who was the army guy. She She's basically the widow of the guy you spoke about. Now, these are clearly political dynasties of some sort that are continuing in Bangladesh. Now, in the case of Khalid Asiya, her, her she has no succession plan, as I had mentioned in in mm -hmm. previously. Now, what is the succession plan of Sheikh Hasina? Because she is no spring chicken either; she's aging. Now, what happens after that in Bangladesh is even more important from an Indian perspective. Hassan Joy, do you think he can manage? What what, what have you heard about him? He is quite the smooth operator. Uh, and he knows what to do. So you think he can manage? I don't think he's as sophisticated in his political management as the mother is. But can he manage? Yes. Yes. So uh, uh, I think he I can. think his name is Sajib Ahmed Wazid, right? Is that his name? Yeah, we call him Joy. Joy, it's right? Joy. And He's currently the advisor to her on information and communication technology, right? That's what his current portfolio or something of that sort. Uh, I Yeah, possibly. I don't know what his current... I mean, look, it doesn't matter. He's the nominated successor. He knows everything. He has a say in everything. Acha, ek, ek, ek aur fascinating bit kya amal mein ki... Bangladesh ka jo political structure is not like us. Like, we are a very federal nation uh, where... Theek hai, prime minister hai, center hai, magar the states have a lot of power. Bangladesh mein aisa kuch nahi hai na, Bijit. Usme center sabse because powerful hai na. Beca because it is so small. See, uh, it is a huge country in terms of population, but in terms of the actual uh, 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 physical area, it is a tiny, tiny country. Right? So where are you going to have uh, th there is absolutely no sense in federalizing this uh, uh, this thing. Hmm. Achha, why didn't you take the name of the daughter of Sheikh Hasina if I went to like Putul. Saima? Okay. Putul. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. I, I, I don't uh, see. I use the Bangla, uh, ba uh, Bangali dark name. You know, we generally don't know people's. Like, I didn't know what my cousin's names were till much later. We only use... <laughs> my Bengali dark naam is Bulu. So everybody only knows me as Bulu. So if you go ask my, uh, what you call Buas, that's your father's sister. How's Obichi Who? You don't know. And then you finally say Bulu. They're like, oh yeah, Bulu. Bulu is doing fine. Bulu keeps coming on TV. Bulu is fine. My cousins are also like that. You ask them Obichi, they'll be like, who? We don't know. So we only refer to them as Joy and Putul. So, look, Putul is very, she's, both the kids, they're very affable, sociable, uh, quite capable also as far as I can tell. 
but uh, Joy is the one that's actually deeply involved in government. Putul is much more, uh, you know, to do with social policy. She focuses on a lot of, uh, I know this sounds really bad, but traditional uh, uh, women roles kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, uh, she's also doesn't have the kind of killer instinct maybe that Joy does. Mm. I don't think either of them have the kind of instincts because remember, none of them have gone through what their mother went through. Imagine watching, being in Germany, watching completely destitute, watching your entire family wiped out overnight, being barred from returning home, having to spend most of your life in exile. It toughens you up in a way. And she is a very good mother. She's done a lot to protect her two children from seeing or feeling the worst of what happened. Hmm. Like, do, uh, uh, in the case of Saima, I think she is currently nominated as the regional director of WHO or something of that sort. It's irrelevant. See, it doesn't matter because yeah. uh, the point is she's not the successor. No. So, so okay. So now let me start taking some of the questions. So the first question is asked by someone. Since the creation of Bangladesh, I have seen that they have the same mindset as that of Pakistan in many ways with respect to the Hindu population and especially to add the Bihari Muslim population who packed the Pakistan army during searchlight, specifically targeting the Hindus. Based on this research with respect to present-day Bangladesh, uh, where do you see this going? Uh, I think Deep has also written a book on this, right? Deep has written a book. Uh, It's very real. The persecution of Hindus continued well after. We don't want to acknowledge it, but Sheikh Mm -hmm. Mujibur did it. Every single government, including Sheikh, Sheikh Hasina, tries to prevent it. The problem is she's genuinely understands what the problem is. I can tell you that with a great deal of authority. Uh, The problem is there are people even within her own party who believe in it. Remember, uh, Mujibur Rahman himself uh, was a uh, uh, was mentored by Shura Vardi Hmm. who was behind Direct Action Day and the Noah Khali riots and uh, you know uh, became Prime Minister of Pakistan as well for for a while. So Shura Hmm. Vardi was uh, his mentor that party has that fundamental sort of DNA to it. Sheikh Hasina is not like that. She tries to hold them back. There is limits to what she can do without alienating people because religion is a very powerful force. She would much rather have localized riots every now and then than a general uprising all at one shot. But yes, you are right. Uh, But Khalida Zia used to be a lot worse. Hmm. And the Jamaat Islami will be a lot, lot, lot worse. Because hmm. the people who run it were openly supporting Pakistan. Never forget that. So I'm going to mix two questions here. This is about the American Bangladesh Indian connection. It's like a uh, uh, three pronged uh, question. How much pressure can India build on the United States of America to not to interfere and indulge in regime change operations? given the BNP power means three front wars for India. And why is the bureaucracy at the State Department so anti-India? They were equally vicious when UPA was in power. They always have been. There's nothing you can do about it because, you know, they don't have a real job. Mm -hmm. Uh, No foreign ministry has a real job. Let's be clear about it. They're all about intangibles. They're really a secretarial service Uh, for what the other tangible departments of government do. Infrastructure, what Nitin Gadkari does, uh, what, uh, uh, you know, uh, Jyoti does with civil aviation, what uh, 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 Rajnath ji does with uh, defense, what Hardeep ji does with uh, uh, urban development, uh, what uh, uh, Nirmala does with industry and things. All of these aggregate into foreign policy. What does a foreign policy person do, boss? Jackie conference may bath karai. What is the tangible of foreign policy? You tell me. The one Mm. tangible which is collection of intelligence, also they don't do properly. Because they're all the moment you get an appointed ambassador to America or Canada or UK, the only thing you're looking at is getting your retirement gig, uh, high paid retirement gig after that. 
okay all your secretaries and things like that are only looking for making extra money by sitting on uh, uh, getting foreign postings where you get that extra allowance so you get a bit more money and things like that kya karoge tum where is the where is the actual and i'm not just criticizing indian foreign policy all foreign policies are like this which is why you know there is a 1996 or 7 paper called state is from venus and defense is from mars you remember that famous book men are from mars and women are from venus it's yes. a thing on that and you'll see state has always been kind of left wing democrat voting uh, uh, sloganeering and shit like that defense has always been about tangibles deliverables uh, hard policy hard results hmm state has to justify its existence doing nothing hmm It, all, a lot of foreign ministries are like this a lot of questions are about the american interference because obviously the title of the podcast was uh, american interference i'm going to club club them together and ask you uh, so somebody has made a question sir, like isn't it right that zia's party has promised the us more military trade engagement and a military base in bangladesh and sheikh hasina is against that so it's quite basically the question is then why would we not expect the americans to go not to really BNP? look khalid azia will never give the americans a base out there because okay. she knows it will ultimately be used against her as well not that khalid azia look khalid azia's party is finished so she is in no position she can make any promise today she knows she doesn't have to live up to it because she's just trying these hail marys right now she's desperate her son is in jail i think she's also in jail or she was in jail for quite some time Uh, I think all her sons are in jail. Khalid Azia is in house arrest. One yeah. person is in London. The son. The other, I think, was had passed away in Kuala Lumpur or something. Somebody is in jail. Somebody is absconding. Can't come back. I don't know what it is. I, I've given up on that because they're kind of an irrelevant party right now. But India can absolutely prevent regime change from happening there up to a point. Ah. Mm -hmm. uh, if the america uh, if the americans decide to do an aircraft carrier based thing then i doubt very much we'll do much to protect bangladesh except raise a stink hmm. but we will always prevent the america from it for from it getting to a stage where the americans have to send in aircraft carriers the problem is bangladeshi polity is much more homogenous like you know what you were talking about the lack of federalization out there mm -hmm. it actually makes it much easier for america to do a sort of color Topple. revolution not regime change you know peaceful regime change is called a color revolution for them to do a color revolution out there to what end is what i don't understand yeah because so it's so it's not in america's interest right now other than ideologically so if you have explained it this way then this question is perfect as a follow up now have the institutions in america then atrophy to a point that they can no longer control their executive agencies then how yes. reliable is us as an ally then they're not they <laughs> realize your problem they're not if look the the point i think this should have been very clear by the jamal khashoggi incident mm. where you sh you know it is always the good of the many over the good of the one you can't have your entire policy taken hostage by the killing of one guy who's not even your own bloody citizen he is a saudi citizen killed in turkey and bloody america is taking the lead on it are you mad hmm so all Amer you, you look at the debt to equity ratio boss how is the economy sustainable with this much debt hmm you tell me what about america is sustainable today i think the fact that american institutions have atrophied and dangerously atrophied is no longer even contestable so no america is not a terribly reliable ally but remember it is only when an when a country is collapsing that you should pretend to be its best ally to get the maximum amount of technology and investment from it mm. all right don't become their ally because they are trustworthy become the ally because you can get the most out of it when it keeps getting weaker and weaker and weaker mm. you know this is why i love my listener base this is another very bold question and and i like it because indians have really you know i love how indians ask these questions so somebody has said if we talk about regime change jobs even we have done it in fiji and mauritius if someone asks about it how do we explain with request to american regime change 
chain jobs. They have not really done it. Uh, you know, Fiji, Frank uh, Bainimarama, who took over uh, uh, the government, he genuinely believed that Indians have a role to play. We didn't support it in any way. He just took it over and kicked out that coup. What was his name? George Spate or something like that. George Spate or George Spate? Uh, he had taken all. He had taken the Indian origin prime minister hostage and things like that. We have not. We have neither done it in Mauritius nor have we done it in uh, uh, this thing. Look, I know for a fact Indian policy doesn't operate that way because we have had very bad experiences in the past, specifically Bangladesh, where we accepted everything that Mujib did, making mm -hmm. it a one-party state and shit like that, where we were in a position to say, please don't do this. We never did that. Mm. Okay. We learn from our mistakes. So we don't actually do this crap. Maldives, what has happened, we will allow it to happen. Did we want better? Yeah. Did we prevent the worst from happening? No, because we believe that these are lessons that need to come home to roost for them. And they will learn the consequences of their own actions. Let them make their mistakes and let them learn. Mm. Sri Lanka has learned its own way, very tough way. But it's had to learn the lesson and it's learned the lesson. Yeah, yeah. Nepal but, will learn the lesson. Bhutan is going to get its ass bitten off. It's going to get its uh, uh, crown princess's pretty little tushi and the, uh, 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 sorry, the uh, queen's pretty little tushi and the uh, uh, jackass of a king, the impotent king's uh, uh, very tight tushi bitten off by Xi Jinping. And then they'll probably learn. But look, I... Whatever China does on Bhutan, I suspect these two, the king and the queen, are going to spend their last days in some Chinese house arrest or jail somewhere in Xinjiang or something like that. Good for them. Good riddance. You mentioned Nepal and you spoke, you know, it, it triggered me the thought in me that, boy, do we live in a shitty neighborhood. <laughs> because now uh, Maldives, mein jo banda aaya, he's not really you know, very friendly to us. And then what do you make of this entire Nepal mein jo nahe protest shuru hai for toppling the government and going back to the monarchy? Yeah, look, uh, Nepal is always, uh, you know, um, it was one of the Koiralas, I forget which one, who said, you know, Nepal is a country surrounded by two dogs. The dog to our north doesn't bark, but it bites. The dog to the south only barks, it never bites. Hmm. Mm. So they've always been more scared. The problem is, the worse your government, the more demagogic it will be and the more it will keep blaming other people. And this is, you know, it's Benito Juarez, who was the president of uh, Mexico, used to say this about America, that Mexico's great tragedy was it was so close to America and so far from God. Mm. You know, so all these countries, their dilemma is they're so far from Allah and they're so close to uh, India. Nepal's now, problem is it is so so far from uh, Gorkhali and so close to uh, India. Bhutan's problem is it is so uh, uh, far from Buddha Maitreya and so close to India. Mm. Bangladesh and Maldives problem is it's so far from Allah and so close to India. <laughs> Sri Lanka's problem is it is so far from the uh, Hinayana uh, Buddha and so close to India. Theravada, 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 right? Ther Theravada, Hinayana. Theravadans, yeah. The, so, Theravada is uh, Hinayana Buddhism. It's not yeah, Hinayana. So, uh, so this is a good question. Now, this is again something that Indians should be worried about. Isn't our biggest threat from Bangladesh the effects of illegal immigration after climate change is going to create havoc in a low-lying area like Bangladesh? Have, yes. have, is there a white paper, Abhijit, in the Indian government circles that has looked at this? Like, Why do you scare me every time? Because the government of India never thinks that far ahead, boss. I mean, you look at the gynocentric laws we have in this country, which are such an obscene shit. They're all passed based on feelings. You know, after that entire Nirbhaya thing happened, what kind of laws did we pass? Did any one of them actually tackle rape in any realistic form? We put out placebo laws and bullshit laws. None of our laws are actually based on careful planning or thought or a data collection process. Even our industrial plans aren't based on that, boss. You know, military, they don't even look at how much you can indigenize based. It's all newspaper articles ka reference. De de de. 
They mm-hmm. don't use an industrial survey of India or a human resource survey of India to plan these things. But that could go. They're a joke. There is no Indian thinking about the effects. First of all, we don't even have the data on proper illegal immigration, boss. Pehle illegal immigration ki baat kar rahe ho, uska authentic data kya hai mereko batao source. Hmm. Wo bhi nahi hai tumhare paas. Ek tu mujhe darata hai aur dousra hai ko Shushant mereko darata hai because Shushant always talks about this scenario. He says Pakistan is going to break. The moment he says Pakistan is going to break, how is that ko Sindhi aur Punjabi kider aayenge? Haan. So, but that you see, the, the, yaar, ye, he, Sindhi Punjabi kahan aayenge? Is see that uh, border is at least much better guarded because it's a land border. Mm-hmm. You see, the Bangladesh border is a heavily uh, estuarine water border. So you do have, uh, uh, kya hai, uh, um, uh, you do have uh, a border fence. So you, it's not I, the most I, in that sense, you're saying it's more manageable in uh, comparison to uh, what would happen if Bangladesh uh, has this illegal immigration into India. Exactly. And so, let's not even get into places like Maldives, which are probably going to go underwater. So between you and I, take mera background textile guy, so I always follow the textile. Do you know India has strategically allowed a lot of textile business to go to Bangladesh out of India? Yes. yes. Strategically strategic. allowed it. No, it's not strategic. And I'll tell you why. Bangladesh allows their sweatshops to become big and become respectable companies. Mm. India prevents... Our, our intent has always been to keep small companies, small, micro, micro, medium, medium, and big, big. Mm. We don't want our micro to become small, our small to become medium, our medium to become large. And therein lies the tragedy. So the economies of scale that accrue, we're never going to accrue in India because of industrial policy. So they naturally shifted to Bangladesh. Mm. They have some Where amazing textile units. They have amazing shit. Because they are allowed to grow. Mm. In India, you are not allowed to grow. But what do you make of the labor protests that have been purposely been festered in Bangladesh? Who do you think is behind that? The Chinese or the Americans? No, no it's actually the trade unions which are core to the Awami League. Remember, the Awami League was a trade union based party. And what it is, is an extortion racket where they want, so the government is always pro-industry. So they keep passing these laws, but nobody actually follows the laws, Mm. uh, except the safety laws. I think the only thing they've cracked down on is safety laws because they said, look, we can't take on labor unions for you if you keep having these sweatshop fires that kill people. Yeah, there are two major accidents there. Yeah, so you please fix your worker safety and we'll see to it, you don't have to pay. There's all this worker benefit, worker pension plan, this and that. They keep legislating. None of the industries actually follow it. They're allowed to keep growing. And that's a good thing. One of the things is, this is where nepotism actually breeds uh, bigger and bigger consolidation of uh, uh, an industry within that country. It's a good thing, technically. Because what the labor unions want is first world worker protections and pay in a third world country, which is not going to happen. Okay. To be fair to the labor unions, they claim, you know, if during boom, you claim uh, better pay and worker protections, you're killing off the boom. If you demand it during bust, then you are destroying the company and making it bankrupt at a time when you shouldn't. So when is the right time to be asking for these things? There is such a thing as a realistic time to be asking for these things and a realistic ask, which they do not. And the government generally tends to support Uh, a Bangladeshi industry and they allow it to grow. It is the same with ceramics. We don't realize this, but all these fine Japanese ceramics are now Noritake and all of them. uh, They are made in Bangladesh. So one of the best things to do when you land up in Bangladesh is to buy ceramics, which a Noritake dinner set, which would cost you about 12 to 13 lakhs for a 10 piece dinner set uh, anywhere else. You will in Bangladesh be able to buy it for three to four lakhs. Or if you buy rejects, there will be flaws that you cannot see, but the Japanese quality inspector would have seen. You can get it for like a 10 lakh set for about 70,000 rupees. 
Okay, I'm going to close. I'm going to twist a couple of questions and then we'll close the podcast. Now, with the Biden administration interfering in Bangladesh, could it also be their way of kind of wanting to interfere in India backhanded manner? That is that is a question somebody wants to say. And uh, considering that both India and China want the same person to win, who do you think benefits more if the same person wins? These are the last questions and then we'll wrap up. We benefit equally because, like I said, Sheikh Hasina's policy is pro economic, pro China economics, and pro India politics. So it suits us. Uh, and yes, America is looking for more pressure points to apply on India, but I don't think they're even looking at that. It's a very ideologically driven process. Okay. Uh, with India, they're consigned to the fact that they can't regime change because we're too diverse and too heterogeneous a country too decentralized to be able to enact that kind of regime change. Yet here, governments themselves can't control elections. Indira Gandhi, for all that imposition of emergency, couldn't manipulate an election that came after that 77 election, right? How do you think the Americans will sit and do it uh, sitting remotely? Hmm. It can't be done. They realize that to an extent. Which is why they've sent a complete loser as their ambassador to India. Because remember, the only ambassadors who do well in India are serious career diplomats and technocrats. Uh, these celebrity ambassadors do nothing for the relationship. And all that Garcetti has been doing is going around eating food and making videos of him dancing Bhangra and... Don't say that. He's pink in the Yes. Yes. He's he's like uh, he, he's like the Ori Avatramani of uh, uh, international diplomacy. What Ori is to uh, you know, I hope everybody knows who Ori is. Uh, so uh, he, he he's the diplomatic Ori. Yeah. So so you know what? We'll close at this. Uh, this was actually a lot of fun, Abhijit. I I actually to ek tune mere ko bola tha how will we cover and the kitni sari cheeze cover karne ko thi. Yeah, actually we did. Yeah, not bad. Yeah. So when they go, you were like, "Are 15 minutes se yada baat nahi kar payenge?" And I told you ki nahi. Wait, there wait. are many things. There, to... there are two three there are two three important questions that we left out. Why was the Nuremberg trial like genocide uh, not committed following the Bangladesh Liberation War? Boss, there was immense pressure on us. We were bankrupt. Mm-hmm. People don't mm. realize, but you know, the expense of the war ultimately led up to 1975 and the emergency. Mm. It was that plus the Arab oil embargo and things like that that led up to the emergency. We were bankrupt and we were looking after 10 million refugees. How mm. trials conduct karte? Uh, and you know, at that time, it wasn't even sure that the uh, we would survive as a country because we were a very weak country in those days. People tend to forget how economically weak we are and things would be used against us and so on and so forth. Mm. Uh, and yeah. uh, other than that, we have covered pretty much everything. Pretty much everything is covered. I, I looked at all the questions. Uh, the rest are just comment. One comment was there about, uh, sh- uh, you know, I mean, I don't want to talk about that comment about women and all of that. It makes yeah. no sense. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I don't want to talk about that. But yeah, so before I wrap it up, I just want to remind people of, so, uh, you know what, at the core of this ba- Bangladesh conundrum is actually Bangladesh policy, which in an ORF paper was written, quote, friendship to all, malice towards none, which is very interesting. And they have a detailed paper. I would recommend all of you to go and read this paper. It was published on ORF on 16th August 2022. The authors were Zeba Fazli, Dilawar Hussain, Achyut Bhandari, Dinesh Bhattarai, Azra Naseem, and Chulani Atanayake. And uh, it is titled India-China Competition Perspectives from the Neighborhood. And it covers a lot of these issues. I would I would say you guys can go and check that out also. It was a very interesting thing that just from a... Now, Nehru, the Nehruvian policy was there of non-alignment and it is what it is. And today, India is doing what it is doing. In a very weird way, I think, I, I know Abhijit explained that it is what Bangladesh is doing is not more non-alignment. It is basically doing horses for courses. Like, we, we will do what benefits us. But it is non-alignment light. And what has happened because of that is like there are four major players trying to poke their nose in Bangladeshi affairs and India being one of them. But let's see how it happens. But Abhijit, once again, thanks, man, for coming. And uh, it was, as always, a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Ta-da, bye.
All right, guys, we'll wrap it up. Go follow Abhijit on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it. Uh, his uh, handle, uh, uh, Twitter address is in the description of the podcast. And if you can, please support this podcast by becoming a member of the Charbuk podcast, whether on YouTube or Fanmo or Patreon. Wherever you go, you can also buy the merch on Kushal Mehra or Kadak merch. You can send your donations to UPI, to Kushal Mehra at ICICI. If you can't do any of that, just like this video. Subscribe to the channel. Leave a comment in the comment section. And if you're listening to this on audio, leave a rating on Spotify, iTunes, wherever you are. I'll see you guys next time. Until then, take care. Bye.